Three, two, one. What's happening, guys? This is Logan Robinson from here, the Spear, presented to you by NoGameDay.com. We are here live on a wonderful, fantastic Wednesday evening, and here we are. We made it. Dustin's about to get hit with another storm, so probably going to lose power from him. We had technical difficulties last week, but we're going to try to do this speedy and quick and not waste too many, too much time on here. But Florida State wrapped up their second scrimmage last week. D. Lou, you were at practice yesterday, so we're going to run through the scrimmage talk. We're going to talk some things about Mike Norvell, giving some praise to DJU. D. Lou was telling us in the production meeting, seems like DJ's starting to really find his groove inside of this offense. So really excited to pick his brain on what he's been seeing at practices. We're going to talk a little bit more, too, of what he's seen uh, just from some of these playmakers. There's been a handful of some youngsters that have been making to play some newcomers like Malik Benson, who scored multiple times in that scrimmage. So we're going to jump into that, and then we're going to talk some top 30 visits, get kind of you know a little warm-up before the NFL draft when we jump into a full preview during next week's show. So you're not going to be on here for too long, but got a handful of things that we definitely need to run through as uh, we've got a lot of practice stuff and scrimmage stuff to uh, go through. But with me this evening is Austin Beasy, our lead basketball writer at NoGameDay.com. And down below is our editor-in-chief, D. Lou. Gentlemen, how are we feeling this evening? Good to uh, be back. And, of course, right when we hop on here for the show, you know, there's another storm coming through Tallahassee, and this one looks pretty pretty vicious. So hopefully I'll be able to stay on here throughout the duration of the show where you guys won't have much to talk about. Yeah, it might oh, well, be an even shorter episode. I can make stuff up and ramble. These guys know I can just sit here and talk if need be, but uh, I'll just make up some things about what I'd imagine I'm seeing at practices. And That's what you see. normally do. <laughs> I do, I do. I just imagine and I try to lead us into a good conversation. And, hey, it's been working the last two years, but if I can make it up to Tallahassee and get to that Thursday one right there, then I'll have all my answers or questions answered, I should say. But uh, before we get started, you can listen to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. You can also watch it on YouTube. We're on Facebook as well. We're on Twitter. Sorry for the kind of delay of setting up uh, the scheduling there on YouTube. Had some issues, some technical difficulties from their side. But it seems like we're fine. Let us know on YouTube if everything's – you can hear us fine. But uh, we're here. Uh, but make sure if you're also on YouTube, hit that like button, subscribe. Also hit that bell so then you get notified every time we release – a new episode over there. If you're on Instagram, if you're on TikTok too, we're over there at Noel Game Day. So got a ton, probably like at least like eight to 10 things posted on those socials all throughout the week. So make sure you guys go check out uh, the content over there. Pucci Kuz904 said it's perfect on YouTube right now. So we're back. Everything's good. So let's get rolling, gentlemen. Scrimmage number two for Florida State during the spring. Got to talk to Mike Norvell afterward. Uh, I was kind of a little dry on most of the details here. Had to do some digging and finding a few things here and there. But from what Mike Norbell told us, let's start off with number one, DJU having probably one of his best days or his best day, like Mike Norbell said, since he's arrived in Tallahassee. He said, I thought today was his best day. He's had some good days in spring practice, but today he operated at a very, very high level. And you saw the confidence of the ball getting out where it's going he also talked about dj's decision making he said even in a couple of throwaways you could tell he was in control of what he was being asked to do today and we've been pretty aggressive with our installation which is a really good sign there uh, we're trying to throw a lot on him right now i liked how he responded i thought he and how he iraq or how he reacted it's exciting to see the progression so it seems like dj's really starting to get down the groove of this offense we kind of were hinting at that we chatted about it in our last episode just because of what you were seeing primarily in practices but it seems like it's translated over into doke into those scrimmages and as we know being at those practices you know norvell and he, he's gonna have the defense he's gonna have adam fuller send a lot of things on these quarterbacks and get them tested early on to understand their reads understand where that pressure is coming from and understand also to where his playmakers and these guys are and their route running um, et cetera. And also too, he puts them in a lot of game like situations. Norvell mentioned that too, in the press conference afterwards saying that we put them through 
more of a game like scenario and put them in more tougher situations. And, you know, he, he mentioned DJ with some really long extended drives, something that he was really happy to see. It's massive because, you know, we you think back to last week when we were talking about the first scrimmage and, you know, Mike was still complimentary of the quarterbacks, but, you know, did talk about some stuff as far as DJ with his footwork and, you know, reverting to some of the stuff that they're they're trying to coach out of him that, you know, maybe he dealt with at Clemson and Oregon State. But then you come back, come back a week later and he has his best day, you know, in Mike Norvell's words since he's arrived at Florida State, you know, it sounded like he operated, executed the offense at a high level throughout the scrimmage, led long drives, led multiple scoring drives. And I thought that continued, you know, we'll get into into it more here, but I thought that continued into Tuesday's practice. You know, I, I thought it was as comfortable as I've seen DJ look um, so far, you know, his ninth practice at Florida State. And as time goes on, he's just getting more and more comfortable in the system, building a little bit more chemistry with his playmakers. And we actually heard Mike Norvell talk about it a little bit in this press conference, but he says, this is the, this is the part of spring where these transfers, you know, they begin to feel a little bit more comfortable. They begin to play a little bit more faster. And I think you're seeing that with DJ and a couple of the other guys as well. And I'm interested too, and I guess this will mix into when we get to practice and such, but DJ has an arsenal of defensive backs that he's having to go against. We're talking elite players. I mean, Azra has been absolutely balling for Florida State in this spring. So it's no easy task whenever you're definitely going and practice, but then over to scrimmage and game-like scenarios going against this defense where you're getting pressured from Pat Payne, who also is getting mentioned quite a bit the last couple of practices and scrimmages as well, recording sacks and sacks and getting back to DJ quite a bit, and then also seeing Marvin Jones Jr. make those strides too and his pass rush ability. So there, it's, it's no easy task, and for them to also be – kind of stressing that they're putting a lot onto DJ. I think it says even more about him as a, a player and understanding just the intel of getting that system down is huge for, for DJ. And it's, it's a really optimistic feeling to have after, you know, you don't no longer have Jordan Travis there and you've got a one year player coming in. You want, you want to see these kind of strides of where you're at at spring camp. I, I, you can tell from Norvell, that he's pleased at where his future QB1 is at right now. And, you know, this is exactly why Florida State went out and in that transfer market, you know, DJ was one of their top options, if not the top option um, for FSU at quarterback, you know, because he's just come in, he's got a sense of maturity. You know, he understands that he's on his third stop and, you know, he's going into his fifth year at the college level. So it feels like, you know, he's trying to help out those younger guys to, encourage them as much as possible <clears throat> as far as the other quarterbacks. But at the same time, you know, for a guy who's on to what his third head coach and his third or fourth offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, I feel like he's taken to the level of attention and detail that Tony Tokar is coaches with. He's taken to that very well. And I feel like those two are very in sync and you're seeing them have a lot of conversations after plays, you know, during individual drills, um, sometimes after drives, you know, he'll go over there and stand with Mike Gravel and talk about stuff to look at the Jumbotron, you know, go over some things, maybe if he should have done this on the play instead or, or whatnot. So, you know, overall with him coming in and, you know, understanding that this is his final year at the college level, um, he's really operating like a pro right now. And we can, I want to, I know Austin has a question for you about DJ here as well, but just going back to those defensive backs, how has that battle been for DJ so far? Because it's such a different feeling from having Jordan Travis, who's been in this program for years and years, and then you throw in DJ here, and he's like, okay, I got to start understanding what these defensive backs are bringing, the versatility. You look at Azra and the lengthiness there, Shaheen Brown, where he, where is he at? And the deep backfield of the defense. Uh, you know, how, how much has that battle been? I feel like that's something that we maybe weren't really thinking of going into the spring camp, but now just thinking, you know, iron sharpens iron in mm. some case here for, for DJ and also these defensive backs. Whenever you're talking about a guy that has a really good deep ball and such a strong arm. Yeah, it's it's good on good. It's competitive battles out there. And, you know, not every throw is the same because you've got the quarterbacks throwing against the defensive backs in so many different scenarios, you know. So you've got the one-on-ones, you've got seven-on-seven, seven, you've got team drills. So it's all a little bit different in the end. And I, I think team drills is probably where I'm paying the most attention to when it's actually, you know, 11-on-11 11 11 
real football out there. And I feel like that's probably where DJ has been the sharpest, especially lately. And, you know, the defensive backs, of course, they've gotten the best of the quarterbacks uh, at times throughout spring camp. That's going to happen. Uh, this is a competitive football team. You've got really good talent on both sides of the ball. But at the same time, when you see DJ settle in a little bit and get comfortable, I mean, man, he's slinging some rockets. He's putting it right there past defensive backs. That arm strength is legit, and I feel like he's at a point where he's making really good decisions in this offense as well. And he's settled down to the point where, you know, it it feels like he's not rushing necessarily to get the ball out of his hand. He's able to sit there a little bit and, and feel comfortable to go through those reads before, you know, some plays having to tuck and run, but a lot of plays where he's able to stay alive and then find a guy late. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I really like the way that he's commanding the offense right now with, uh, you know, the back half of the spring kind of coming up. And obviously it's early on in this process with DJ. How would you say – the way the system's operating right now with DJ compares to last season at this point with Jordan Travis. At the same point, what do you think that ceiling could be with DJ? Because, you know, there's there's a lot of content creators and analysts that aren't very high on DJ at Florida State. Like There's even some quarterback tier lists that have him as like the fourth worst quarterback in the conference. I don't think he's that bad. But where do you think that ceiling kind of is for DJ at this point? It's definitely an offense of moving parts. I mean, obviously, DJ's coming in and learning a new system, but – you've got the same thing happening at running back, at wide receiver. You've got new additions on the offensive line and and obviously a guy in Robert Scott who's out for the rest of the spring. And, you know, at tight end, you're bringing in a new face in Landon Thomas. So it's a little bit of an offense of moving parts. And, you know, everyone's trying to get used to how Florida State runs the system and building that um, continuity and chemistry. But, I mean, you look at what Florida State was able to do with Jordan Travis. And obviously Jordan was an immensely talented player himself, but – also, the coaching and the development that he received under Mike Norvell and Tony Tokars. And I think that's something that's got to be really exciting for Florida State fans because Jordan Travis, I mean, he's going to probably be drafted in a couple of weeks, but he doesn't necessarily have the elite physical tools that someone like DJ has. You know, six foot four, 255 pounds, cannon of an arm. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit. We got, we got to see some of his um, escapability a little bit. And for being 250 pounds, that dude can move uh, good enough to get things done. We'll, we'll talk about that later on. So just what he brings to the table physically, if he's able to get down this offense and continue to build that timing with the wide receivers, I mean, I'm really excited for what we could see. I think this is going to be an offense where you're seeing a lot of big plays, for say, trying to take the top off the defense. I mean, so far, especially as of late, you're starting to see those plays connect more and more, and I, I think it's it's something that Florida State fans should be cautiously optimistic about of what DJ could turn into in Tallahassee. That's good. Uh, a few things, too, and we'll get to practice uh, talk here in a second, but beforehand, a few things also in the scrimmage. Norvell mentioned uh, Brock Glenn. Felt like he operated well throughout the scrimmage, had some good plays and some good moments which is a good sign there for growth from him on the second-year quarterback. And also, to the newcomer, Luke Romanhock, he got some praise from Coach on his third down plays, which I think that says a lot, too, just about intel and his intelligence um, of understanding you know, where the ball needs to go or you play it safe and certain things like that and the circumstances that they were putting Luke through as a true freshman. So overall, I mean, I think it's great to hear – the progress there that's been made that's being made across the whole entire quarterback room, but definitely some of those younger guys that are behind DJ right now at the moment. Um, and just, I think for me, Luke, them making those third down plays, I think is really impressive. And that's something that why Mike Norvell, Tony Tokars did a lot of their homework on and got to Luke early on in his recruitment. And it, 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 it's going to pay off uh, and you just got to allow him to, learn and, and grow as, as a player. But those are some good things I thought was worth noting from Norvell on, on Glenn and Luke as well. Yeah, there are a couple of plays each practice where you see Luke and, and that ball fly out of his hand and you're like, man, this kid's going to be really damn good in a couple mm. of years. And uh, we'll see where he progresses. But, I mean, his ceiling is immensely high. I mean, that's that's really the hand-picked, you know, Mike Norvell and, and Tony Tokar's quarterback recruit that they've been working on for years. And I think he's going to be a good one for Florida State. And then, you know, right there with Brock Lynn, he's continuing to make those strides. He's competing with DJ. I think I talked about last week, but I feel like he's raised his level 
of play. And, you know, he's doing his part to really compete and match DJ and make it as hard as possible for the graduate transfer who most expect to win the starting job to actually, you know, end up taking those reins. And right now I think this is a battle that's probably going to go all the way into fall camp. I like it. I like it. And then to some, a few things here who found the end zone and who found it the most uh, Malik Benson, multiple touchdowns there from him. A video was shown from both of these guys, but Jalen Lucas showing off that speed off the edge. I mean, that, that's wild going down the sideline like that. That dude has so much speed. I wish I would, I, I could see it in person. I'm sure it's super fun for you, <laughs> Dustin, every practice, but that's, I guess, speedy. Who would you, who would you compare him to speed wise off the side like that? I mean, we, we've all seen Trey Benson, but that's a whole different kind of like animal and, and physical build. I can't relate fully to, you know, we got to see Corey Wren practice but it never fully translated in this aspect and this is such a smaller dude i mean yeah. it's i don't know who to really compare him to i mean maybe jakai but that's his brother uh, i know i know I, that's that's what i'm saying i feel like that's a cheat code I the first name code. that came to mind uh was kermit whitfield for some yeah. reason kermit but i feel but i feel like lucas is a better football player on offense. You know, he's more than a special team threat. And that was something that he talked about um, following Thursday's practice. You know, he wants to be known for what he can do on offense more than what he can do on special teams. And I think so far he's surpassed probably the expert expectations that a lot of people had for him coming into the spring with what he's done on the ground, but I mean, also through the air as well. And I mean, it, he seems like someone that is in position to get a lot of touches in Florida State's backfield. They've got to be a little bit more creative, you know, with how to use them, with them being at that five foot eight, five foot nine size. But you put them in the right positions, you find some way to get them out into a little bit of open space, and he'll turn an inch into a mile. Here's a name that came to mind for me for him, and maybe it was more how he was utilized in the NFL. But what about Chris Thompson? Another smaller guy, five seven, mm -hmm. ran yeah. in the four fours. And I think yeah. Jalen is faster than that, honestly. But I think he could be using that same kind of role that Thompson was using, especially with Washington early on. Yeah, football speed there's different between track speed and football speed and who can carry the pads better and yeah chris mm -hmm. thompson was literally the like he set the standard for that i felt like i don't hate it because lucas he does run with some of that same kind of toughness as chris thompson you know even though he's a smaller guy he's going to go out there and give you all he's got uh race between coach norvell and i i don't know i think norvell is like starting to increase the speed a little bit we're starting to see these videos and each time he's getting faster and faster so i might have my work cut out for me but los carlos williams i know you you tune in here sometimes so if you still want it let me know we'll be up in tally uh this next weekend so just let me know i'm ready to run it whenever you are um but uh a guy though malik benson man keeps on effing balling you know and i think that's now we were talking on the production meeting this man is he's putting himself in the spot to be a starter for fsu going into this 2024 season uh and he's carried himself really highly just from what we what y'all saw on tour of duty he's starting to become a vocal leader a guy that's pushing guys behind them and, and setting the standard and he seems like he has fully 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 bought into what mike norvell brings to the table with this program but malik benson found uh, multiple touchdowns, and then also, too, we saw in the video from FSU, uh, Camden Fryer caught a really nice ball uh, that, I mean, honestly, just over the shoulder like that, not easy whatsoever. But that's Dustin, that's what we saw from him in the lead camp a couple years ago, man. That kid, he's got crazy speed. He's got crazy speed, and he's got a really good knack of, of utilizing his body to come down with the ball. I think of him and, like, probably Vondravius Jacobs, of those two guys being really – really good with, with getting to the they're using their ability to, to catch the ball uh, but yeah Malik Benson ball in that wide receiver room is so special that was a fun one for Fryer because you know he's had a couple drops the last couple of practices so it was good to see him respond with a big play in the scrimmage and then I mean he also had some catches yesterday during Tuesday's practice but Malik Benson no surprise you know we've been talking about him for I mean since since we went out and were able to observe tour of duty we kind of felt like this dude was going to be a ball player and he's carried that into spring pra practice so far. And, you know, I would say at least once a practice, he's 
making a big catch. I think I said that about Jalen Lucas last week. At least once in practice, he's having a big run. Same thing with Malik Benson. You know, um, last last Thursday, he actually had a drop. And it was kind of funny because Adam Fuller went over to him and told him, hey, you got to catch that ball. And then, like, the next play, Malik came back. And I don't know how he caught it. All I know is he was on the ground and the football was, like, tucked between his knees. Like, he caught it with his legs. Mm -hmm. And he's pointing at it like it's a catch. And, I mean, it's just ridiculous. You know, he finds a way to make a play. And I I think he's going to be a good one for Florida State. I've liked this pickup since since the beginning. You know, record-setting wide receiver in Juco. Got that experience with Alabama. And, I mean, he could take – the top off of a defense here, especially with DJ. I mean, sling that thing 50, 55 yards down the field at, at will. That's kind of what I feel like Minerville has set up for this offense to be in, in 2024. Toss it up and, and, and see who comes down with it. Whereas you saw this last year and definitely when Johnny was here as well, you know, you still, you had the height there factor and whatnot, but you didn't have the speed to lead, lead that ball on as long as you probably could as like you had with Ja'Kai Douglas for the most part there. And you got to go back and find that pokey that you had where he would blow up the back end of a defense. They're just utilizing his speed. And you saw J Trav connect with him multiple times. And those plays are game changers for FSU. And that's something Mike Norvell predicates his offense on. And that's something that was kind of felt like a little limited in, in some regard uh, this last year for Florida state. And you could tell in some games here and there, it's still, Freaking won 13 games, 13 0, but still the, these kind of speedy guys, just like Mike Norvell told us in that preseason or in the um, press conference before spring, that there's so much speed and on this team and a lot of strength as well. But speed, I think, is going to be the biggest factor in 2024. Um, but yeah, there, there's so much to like. So that's the scrimmage number two. Uh, two, the biggest thing out of it seemed like for the most part, yeah, there's some bangs and some bruises, but for the most part coming out of that healthy, which is a good thing. I think, too, we weren't on here. Were we on here last week when we got to talk about Destin Hill? I don't think. Yeah. Not uh, entirely. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe that was on Thursday. I, I'm not I entirely sure either. Maybe the chat can tell us. If not, though, we might have to mention it on here. I feel like there's there's been two injury updates. Yeah, I don't think we talked about Destin. No, no Destin Hill is going to miss on April fifth. Yeah, um, yeah, Destin Hill is going to miss the remainder of spring camp, which obviously someone who you know talented is all get out, but you don't want to hear that. Uh, not season-ending injury. Seems like it's something, though, he's going to have to recover and, and get back to 100%, so it's going to take a little bit of time there. But you take a hit there a little bit in that wide receiver room. It's absolutely loaded, like we just got done talking about. But still, you wanted to see Destin have as much of a chance during this spring camp to build, honestly, to me, still get that system down, but also start building that chemistry with DJ and whoever else is going to be at that quarterback position. Uh, knock on wood, you know, whoever's going to be out there healthy-wise. But still, to build that chemistry with DJ uh, w- would have been huge, and um, I just wanted to see him have that growth. And But definitely not a not a fun hit there for that wide receiver room, but it's allowed for some of these youngsters like a Luane McCoy or other dudes to come in and get a lot of reps, but uh, a tough loss there for a guy this spring. Yeah, a heartbreaking blow for Florida State to have Destin Hill out for the next couple of weeks because, you know, he was starting to show that improvement this spring. And, I mean, he had probably been one of the more consistent wide receivers uh, through the first, you know, first, I guess, eight practices, seven practices, whatever it was before he went down um, with that injury. But also with that, you know, Jarrell Powers as well in that announcement, he's going to be missing – the remainder of the spring too, you know, reserve tight end for Florida State through most of his career. He's he's dealt with some injuries before in the past, and uh, you know they were kind of hoping to see a little bit more out of him this spring, start to show some of that development because this is a guy who transitioned from wide receiver to tight end whenever he arrived in Tallahassee. Same recruiting class as Brian Courtney, who obviously moved from quarterback to tight end. So you know you were hoping to see a little bit of flashes in that development and. That's another one that stings because Florida State only five scholarship tight ends. That means they're operating with four for the rest of spring practice. 
yeah, not a fan of that. Not a fan of that at all. Uh, someone that I wanted to see have some growth as well. It's just those those younger guys that you want to see take that next step. And spring is so big. Like we're talking about James Coleman, been staying in contact with him the last couple of weeks. You know, getting some thoughts on what he's seen at scrimmages and whatnot in practice as well. But you know, seeing these younger guys take that next step is so big during the spring part of things because it's not, you're not getting ready for a game or anything. You're just solely predicating yourself on learning the systems from both offense and defense, special teams. So it just, it just stinks for that. And so uh, definitely for, you know, Destin, who we're expecting to see a lot of in 2024, uh, it, it definitely blows. So just got to hope those guys get back fully healthy. And like for Drell Powers, that, that's just too thin of a tight end room. And I like what I see from, Drell, and I'm interested to see how he does throughout his career at FSU, but this just stings whenever you don't have a spring camp under your belt. Yeah, um, I think – I think sorry to cut you off, no, but I you're think good. you're at the point where, for say, they're going to have to seriously consider investing in that tight end position when the transfer portal window opens up on Monday, you know, 15-day window. Not exactly sure of the quality of tight ends that are going to be available just yet. You know, last year they were able to snag Keon Coleman – the the star wide receiver out of the portal. So if there's someone like that that hops in at tight end, or I mean, even at other positions, you know, I could see them if there is another bona fide star wide receiver that hops in the portal, I could see Florida State taking a look. Or if there's a really productive linebacker, I think I could see the same sort of thing. But those are kind of the positions I'm looking at as of right now. Mm -hmm. Hey, again, some love. VZ on the banner back there. It's been there for a couple of years now, though. Yeah, uh, I've I've had it since college. I'm not allowed to say where I got it from for reasons. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I don't think that it's was a, for sale. It's uh like ten feet long and it's solid plastic. It's pretty heavy. I'll get out the yeah. way. Oh no, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty heavy for the banner VZ. It's fine. One step away. It's fine. No, 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 no. We can't have that happen. Um. But yeah, let, let's go move over to some practice, gentlemen. Uh, we were just talking a little bit uh, about him uh, a tiny bit, but Loy McCoy seems like he's been a dude that has made some really significant uh, shines during practices. We'll go to practice here uh, on Tuesday, but uh, le- earned some good praise from Mike Norvell. Now, did you have to say freaking or did Norvell? That's, that's is is it actually freaking or was it it's a real quote. great? effing job that's he said freak in that time okay okay i'm making sure i didn't know if you had to you know you know play got to play cool we're credentialed i wouldn't put it in quotes i I wouldn't put it in quotes if it wasn't real (laughs) that's true that's right you are a professional at what you do but uh yeah getting some nice praise there from uh, mike norvell great freaking job Mike Norvell told him, but tell us about the way mccoy because i see him all over twitter people chatting about him a little bit but you're there firsthand. What have you seen from this cat? Because it seems like it just you're like, okay, more wide receivers. This this room complete completely just tells us it's loaded. He's fun, dude. I remember whenever he committed and we pulled up that highlight tape of him making that like crazy one head one handed catch in one of those seven on seven tournaments, you know. He's a playmaker and I you know, he's gotta start doing it a little bit more consistently, but when he has a good rep it's a good rep and he's had a couple good reps last couple of practices, you know, Thursday making some tough catches. And then he came back yesterday, um, had a grab over the middle where he took an instant shot from AZ. I mean, a tough hit and fell to the ground, held on to the football. And then the very next play, uh, Florida state threw a pass out of the backfield to a running back on the right-hand side of the field. And McCoy got over there and laid a block on a DB to kind of spring that play loose a little bit. And that was what earned the great freaking job for Mike Norvell for having his wide receiver blocking downfield, which is obviously um, a very big component in Florida State's offense. I mean, if you want to get on the field as a wide receiver and catch passes, you're going to have to go block for these running backs as well. It's a, it's a two-way street at yep. Florida State. Uh, like and then you saw, like McLean. Yeah, you saw him come on – continue that uh, kind of upward climb into one-on-ones where, I mean, he had another tough grab with Jabril all over him and then an athletic extension where he showed some of that playmaking ability for an end zone catch to kind of cap off that period. So the true freshman, you know, we've mentioned him in spurts throughout uh, spring practice, but at least the last three days, you know, last Thursday, he got some love in the scrimmage on Saturday 
from Norvell. And then yesterday during Tuesday's practice, it feels like he's starting to make that ascension a little bit. Man, yeah, no, there we go. Um, this guy's <laughs> dialed in. I'm just checking. The, this is what happens when we're on the IG, man. You never know what's going to pop up. But <laughs> no, nah, I'm glad. I, I'm glad. It's good to hear that. I mean, Ron Dugans is doing a good job in that room, too. I always give him credit to the donk, but these guys are developing. But they're also doing a really good job on the recruiting front as well, bringing in this natural talent. Uh, you, you can tell, and it doesn't take long for these guys uh, to mesh with the offense. Two, another guy in the wide receiver room. I've got I got two on offense and two on defense. D. Lou, feel free to add more offense before I go over to defense next. But I wanted to mention Jakai Douglas as someone who I felt like it seemed like almost won the day for the most part offensively. This this dude uh, went off and made some multiple plays. But I'll let you describe him more. But uh, Jakai Douglas, someone that a lot of people might not think of too much of, but he's going to play a vital part in this offense this next season. He flies a little bit under the radar, but I mean, you got to think throughout his career, Jakai's been a solid option for Florida State. I mean, he's made some really big plays in big moments. I mean, you think back to that game during the 2023 season, Florida State goes to Pittsburgh a couple hours before the game. The notification comes out that Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman both aren't going to be able to suit up. And, yeah. you know, Florida State, they relied on Jakai to have one of the best games of his career uh, to, to help win that game. But, you know, he's just kind of been that solid veteran presence. And like I said, you kind of take him for granted a little bit. Maybe it's because he's a little bit of a smaller guy or he's been here for so long or whatever it is. But, you know, there are still those moments where Ja'Kai Douglas, he catches one on the sideline. He's tightly covered by a defensive back, puts a move on him, cuts across the field, goes, you know, 30, 40, 50 yards to the end zone, really shows off that explosive speed. And I, you know, I think he's going to be a good one for Florida State. He's kind of like a little bit of a safety valve, if you will, and he should be a solid option there uh, at that slot wide receiver if he can continue to do it. And, you know, he even said it uh, last week in an interview. He's at the point of his career where he knows he's the veteran. He knows he's supposed to be one of the leaders, and he's doing his part to set an example for his brother Jalen Lucas and some of the younger players on the team and, and wants to put forth some consistent practices. And I think you've seen that, you know, I mentioned that big play, but he had another one also yesterday and one-on-ones went up on the sideline and, you know, we're talking about five foot nine, Ja'Kai Douglas mm-hmm. went up on the sideline and made a vertical catch, you know, over a defensive back, really tight coverage. And uh, it was one of the splash, splash plays of the day that drew a reaction from the entire offense. Mm-hmm. What do you think, VZ, about Ja'Kai Douglas? What would you – He's been he's on the good, show before, so. He's a good slot receiver. I mean, right. was, like you mentioned that pick game last last year, he was incredible. I mean, Jordan Travis continuously targeted him. He came down with key catches, long, long targets as well. We'll see how he does with arguably a deeper room than last year. I think the top end talent was probably better last year, but it's much deeper this year. Mm. And seeing how he revolves in and out of that lineup is going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then if there's anything more offensively, D. Lou, that you wanted to mention, I just wanted to kind of push out the two strongest things that I thought offensively were worth mentioning. Um, I've got some things defensively, though. Yeah, I was just going to say I thought DJ and I'm, you know, I said it earlier in yep. the show, but man, I thought he was excellent on Tuesday. Made some really tough throws, uh, some very well-placed balls. The one that caught my attention, uh, in seven-on-seven, a throw to Landon Thomas out on the sideline where, I mean, he led Landon to the ball perfectly. It was in a spot in between two defenders where only Landon had a shot on it. Mm -hmm. The true freshman tight end was able to come down with it. I mean, that was a throw where I was like, man, like that's, that's an elite throw. Right there. And I mean, he had a couple other ones on the day. That was the one that stood out the most. And then going back to Thursday's practice, we got to see him scramble a little bit. Finally seeing DJ move downfield. And one of the first plays where he was actually able to take off and you start to see that 255 pound frame, you know, moving down down Mm. the field. He actually, uh, Hakeem Williams was trying to block for him. And man, DJ just ran him right over. And Hakeem (laughs) just... You know, Hakeem's a big dude himself. Yeah, he's big now. Bounced off of DJ, man. I mean, it was... (laughs) It was Dude, crazy. I want to see. I, I mean, I don't want to see it. And definitely Coach Rovell doesn't want to see it. No FSU fan wants to see it. But just if I could have a drill with DJ versus DJ up the middle, 
We're talking Lundy versus <laughs> Louis Anglais. Can we not? I don't want to. I don't. I, I just want to imagine it. I just like big hits. And I, I mean, that's why we love football. We're here to hit, you know. And in, in five years, we'll be playing flag football. So enjoy it while you have it. But I mean, two big boys going at it. I mean, we're going to see it in football games this upcoming season. There's going to be a big linebacker that's going to try to pop him, and I think they're going to find out that nah, nah, he's been enjoying Waterburger in Tallahassee a little bit too much. So I think he's going to be taking them down. Well, but, he's still uh, moving. I mean, yeah. we got to the team. Yeah, how does he move with it? How do you think he's moving with? with that weight you know like we saw in oregon state he'd be able to make some moves on some guys but he's put on some extra weight since arriving in tallahassee how has he moved whenever taking the ball in his own hands and going he's not he's not as fast you know top end as jordan travis maybe not as fast top end as brock glenn who you know mike norvell said yesterday he had 20 over 20 miles per hour on the gps on one of his runs but He's dude, he's moving for being 255 pounds. Like he can get into open space. He can create some plays. Um, going back to Thursday's practice, you know, they were kind of doing a, a late game situation at the end. And two of the few successful plays were actually, you know, DJ passes that turned into him having to scramble downfield. And one of them was for, I want to say 20 plus yards where he was able to get out of the pocket, roll out a little bit. Defense had backed up because they're trying to defend, um, deep downfield, prevent a deep ball, and he scrambled out. I mean, got all the way to the first down before a defensive back was able to get to him. So he's more than capable to, uh, you know, keep defenses on us on his own. It's gonna be fun this season. I think mean, uh, at least that part of it with his game. You know, you want to you had that strong arm ability, but if if a play breaks down, that that was my biggest question mark going into camp. You know, just how the offensive line is going to have to operate in a way of protecting DJ so he can get that ball downfield. Whereas you had JT back there and he was so magically, literally magically elusive um, back there in the backfield when, you know, the offensive line missed out on the block there and he'd have to get out and escape the pressure. So um, that's something, you know, I, I'm interested in seeing as well. Uh, defensively though, uh seems like we've got some interception guys here that are consistently making plays and taking the ball away from the quarterbacks. So we're going to go on the opposite side here, but Conrad Hussey and Greedy Vance, both recording uh, interceptions there. I kind of know, I guess I have a question for maybe more greedy. I had, had, a, had a nice season last year and obviously got a lot more praise the year prior because of the country and interceptions there. But what have you seen from Greedy? Because he's got a ton of competition there in that room and where he's at in the defensive backfield. Uh, maybe just a little touch there on also Conrad Hussey and what you've seen from him in camp as well, because we are very high on him here at Hear the Spear. Yeah, Greedy kind of reminds me a little bit of Ja'Kai Douglas, where you know he's been here at Florida State so long that he's flying a little bit under the radar. And you've got some new additions to that room, obviously Earl Little Jr. coming in from Alabama and you know, Kevin yeah. Knowles converting back down to that cornerback spot after spending the 2023 season at safety. So he's a little under the radar, but I mean, man, you know, you look at these practice reports, um, he's tied for first now with Conrad Hussey and turnovers forced through nine spring practices. You know, we'll see if that continues, but I believe Greedy's all, all four of them have been interceptions. I mean, he's going out there and uh, making the play Damn. himself, but you know, I feel like he's been, been super solid to this point, doing what he should do. Obviously, he's a little bit smaller um, in that cornerback room, but he's a very physical guy. And I also like the way that he's leading the room. Like there was one point last practice where um, it was either one of the true freshmen or one of the second year guys. Whenever the de- the defense and I mean the offense too, but whenever they're coming off the field after a seven on seven, you know, rep or drive yeah. or eleven on eleven. Like these guys, they have to jog off the field. And at one point, there was a freshman who kind of walked the final five yards to get to the sideline. And Greedy walked over, you know, pointed at him and said, Go back and jog off. And I mean, the younger player listened. So I, I just think that's a cool little detail yeah. that you just kind of see the culture. You know, it's not, he, it's not something crazy, but to make sure that they're living up to not only what the coaches want them to do, but, you know, you're seeing the players take on leadership roles. And it's funny because even yesterday, Adam Fuller, did it to Shaheem. So, I mean, they're, they're holding everybody accountable from top to bottom. I was going to say greedy kind of arrived in that manner too, of just being a vocal guy and, and bringing that leadership with him as well. And that's what set him in a good spot for him in that year 
one at FSU to lead the country in interception. This guy came in, dialed in, and and bought in immediately. Like we're seeing, you know, Malik Benson from Alabama. But I had something I was just curious on, just for for greedy fans, because he does have some guys nicking at some playing time right there, and he's held it's held a spot. But uh, just interested to see how that's been with a guy like Earl Little Jr. coming from Alabama, who you can tell, you know, has all the natural ability in the world to come and take some playing time from you. So just yeah. nonetheless, though, you have such great depth, I think, in that in that room that was kind of just not as as healthy as it is, as it was, you know, as it is right now than what you had last year. Um, well, you still had two. No, we'll talk about him here, but we got some, got some top 30 visits, though, um, with, with some guys that are getting some looks on the NFL side, but like Jarian Jones. Um, and also to Akeem Dent getting some love, but we'll talk about that here in just a minute. And then it seems like Pat Payne's causing havoc. He, it seems like he's just causing trouble. And I want to get your thoughts too, on the other side, who else to you, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who's going to be that DE two of the spring. I will put it just for the spring. Don't we're not, we're not going to name any starters for the fall. We won't do that until we clickbait you guys when we do that. We were in the summer, but who do you is DE2 on the other side of Pat? His nickname's Glizzy, Peyton. <laughs> Let me make sure that's right, because I'm going to go to his Instagram right now. <laughs> that's Hold funny, on. man, but that's a, that's a tough question. Um, Pat Peyton, yeah, I thought Thursday P. was <laughs> thought Thursday P. Glizzy, was by the best way. practice P. so far. You know, we've talked about him putting on that weight continuing to improve obviously he's stepping into that star defensive end spot here at Florida State kind of the next one up in the uh the batter's box and I think so far this spring he's lived up to the expectation um Thursday multiple sacks multiple pressures and it was really him and also Marvin Jones Jr. on that other side kind of collapsing on the pocket uh wreaking a ton of havoc before you know they went into that second scrimmage and it sounded like coming out of the second scrimmage you know once again the defensive front was something that flashed to Mike Norvell and he talked about the pressure and the athleticism that these guys bring, particularly in those third and long situations where they're able to just pin their ears back and go after the quarterback. But, man, I mean, I, th I think I talked about last week, but this defensive interim, I've been really impressed. You know, obviously Jared Verse is gone. Gilbert Edmonds gone. There's there's a lot of new names. There's some younger guys in the room like Jaden Jones and Byron Turner who are continuing to grow. And the transfers that have come in, you know, Sione, Marvin Jones Jr., Tomiwa, who's switching there between the inside and the outside. They've all been super solid. I mean, you've got six real good defensive ends there. And then you're at the point now where, you know, Aaron Hester, a guy who's dealt with some injuries throughout his career, kind of a tweener a little bit between that defensive end and linebacker size, if you will. He's been making plays during practice. I mean, mm. he's a guy that Mike Norbell has been naming after these scrimmages. Last week he had a uh, – I think multiple sacks in either the the Tuesday or the Thursday practice. So I really like the progress that we've seen from the top to the bottom. I think as of now, probably Marvin Jones Jr. is playing a little bit more consistent, a little bit more physical than everyone else. But, I mean, this is a job that's up for the taking. And, and plus, we also know how Florida State rotates these defensive ends. I mean, we're going to see a lot of different guys – get snaps it's been a four-man rotation typically you know throughout 22 and 2023 we'll see if that changes at all with I mean just the amount of guys that they can actually use uh, out of that unit I mean there's there's so much talent there was a question on here from our guy Terrell asking who is going to the spring game for coverage and D. Lou and I will be there with a handful of oh, you're going no game day staff VZ's not going no nope, you're going not, not for me you're the same before the show. You're not going. I if I can get if I can get this if I can get some fix with my body, I will be there. I'm trying to be there, but um, God, now it's gonna make it sound like I've got some sick stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, plan on being there. We'll have a lot of people on hand for that, nonetheless, for coverage. And then, uh, have you noticed with Mike Norvell? I know a video is coming out with the climb, but Mike Norvell with the walkie talking now this year, college coaches can go into like the NFL side of things where you can jump in and talk to your quarterback with uh, the headset or walkie talkie with whatever they're going to be using, but it's going to be a headset when they get on the game field. But 
have you noticed Norvell and how that's kind of working with the quarterbacks and practices so far? As much as we saw on that video, which I thought was hilarious, but yeah, you're also seeing it on the defensive side of the ball too. So like Adam Fuller is able to talk to yeah. some of these linebackers. Linebacker is basically the quarterback of the defense and – you know, he's out there barking instructions to DJ because I stand on the defensive sideline more than the offensive sideline during the practices. That's just kind of how it ends up working out. And normally I stand right around where Fuller is. So, you know, it's cool to hear him, you know, relaying some of these commands and shouting into his walkie talkie like DJ, get so and so to move here. And you you look over and you watch Lundy like point out to a defensive back and have him shift or something like that. Yeah. So you're, you're seeing it in real time. I, I think it's going to be uh, really cool to see that implemented in college football. There's still going to be signs, obviously, coming from the sideline, but it's going to make it a little bit harder, I guess, for you know stuff to get stolen by, by other college staffs. I'm looking at you, Auburn. I'm looking at you. And Ohio State. <laughs> Michigan. That's, that's a <laughs> major mess up there. <laughs> Unbelievable. Ah, they're probably both doing it. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's doing it it's just you just don't try to get caught on national championship tv coverage um but yeah so some good uh, practice tomorrow right yeah i won't be there tomorrow tommy and jackson are going to be locking it down for us i'm right. i'm in wedding preparation i'm, I'm the best man so oh. gotta be there for my boys i'm gonna miss out on this one but we'll be we'll be back out there uh, next tuesday thursday and then obviously the spring showcase that Saturday, April 20th. Yeah, it's going to look interesting with Doak looking the way it is right now. So best of luck to everybody going in there and everything. It's it's going to be interesting with the parking. We are we already know if you've gone to FSU or you've just been there for games, parking is one of the worst things on that campus. So best of luck to everybody that's trying to attend this spring game where that's going to be kind of limited in both attendance and seating and also and the parking from what I read online. <clears throat> um, let's jump into some NFL top 30 stuff, unless you won't have any more defensive things that you want to bring up from practice on Tuesday of yesterday. Uh, the only other thing that I had noted down was KJ Sampson. And I'm, mm -hmm. I think we might have talked about him last Wednesday, but he's just a dude who's – he brings a lot of effort to the table you know some of these guys are very physical and athletic at the point of attack but the extra effort is kind of the stuff that shows up on certain plays you know you think about Braden Fisk last year and him pursuing guys downfield and things like that you're seeing the same sort of thing from KJ Samson like there was a run yesterday from Brock, Brock Lynn where he was able to get out into the open field and probably a 15 20 yard run or so and I wasn't really paying that much attention to who stopped him. And I see right there as the play ends, Mike Norvell is tapping KJ Sampson on the head and, you know, giving – he calls him Keith sometimes, giving Keith some props because I guess Keith is his name. He likes to go by KJ. But, yeah, that, that was something – another thing I had noted, Alan, it's been yeah. standing out to me. And that's huge for Florida State because that yeah. interior, not necessarily a ton of depth. You're missing Joshua Farmer at the moment, obviously introducing Grady Kelly and also – Tom Iway, who, you know, we've talked about the versatility. They're in that room a little bit. But if K.J. Sampson can be that dude, I mean, we all remember, this was a blue-chip recruit. Uh, Logan, you know, we were on yeah. campus that day whenever he committed to Florida State, kind of out of the blue a yeah. little bit. I mean, he's stuck with it ever since. I mean, this is a guy that, you know, you'd like to continue to see grow, develop, and make those positive strides. I think of Daniel Lyons, if he can make those strides and what we saw from yeah. Lyons, that would be huge for this defensive line room and depth and, you know, what you want to have for next season because that's one that we're keeping a very close eye on. Don't have Joshua Farmer this spring recovering from injury. So, uh, yeah, got to see those strides he made. So shout out to Odell Hagens for his room. Let's end off the show, though, gentlemen. We got some NFL stuff to talk about. It has been a busy, busy last couple of months in both combine stuff and NFL visits. And it's, as expected, a lot of these FSU players are traveling left and right to visit some of these uh, organizations, really. Let's we'll start off with a few of these guys. Braden Fisk, one of the top hot names out of FSU. You've got absolute freaks like Jared Verse. Johnny Wilson, Trey Benson, 
Keon Coleman, but Brandon Fisk has been a hot name. He has gotten visits or has made visits to the Chargers, Raiders, and my Pittsburgh Steelers. Jared Verse has visited the Atlanta Falcons. He's planning to visit with the Seattle Seahawks, Bucks, and Broncos. Keon Coleman, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and the New Orleans Saints. I think New Orleans really likes Keon quite a bit, just of what they've been scouting, it seems like. I know and honestly, and I are like on the same wavelength on keeping up with a lot of these guys on the NFL side, but yeah, scouting well, wise. One of the biggest comparisons with him, too, has been Marcus Colston, who was one of the greatest receivers in the 2000s. Honestly, one yeah. of the more underrated guys. Really thrived in New Orleans, and I could see him playing that kind of big slot role that Colston mm -hmm. was playing. So I think it'd be a great fit. Yeah, yeah. And then over for the defensive backfield, we got Jarian Jones. He's picked up a handful. The Indianapolis Colts, Green Bay Packers, and the Philadelphia Eagles as well. Uh, staying uh, on the defensive backfield too, Akeem Dent getting some love. I'm so happy for him after an impressive showing at Pro Day, Green Bay Packers, and he posted on his Instagram story today. Me and Busy are trying to figure out if that's just a connecting flight he was making, but he posted on his Instagram story one more, and I'm wondering if that's one of his la if he if this is his last NFL visit that he's making or whatnot. But keep an eye on your team though, Busy, the Vikings. Uh, potential visit there for Akeem. Just got to confirm that, and I'm sure we'll get confirmation by tomorrow on that uh, for him. And then going back over on the offense, Jahi Bell, New England Patriots. Patriots always like bringing in some guys that have some versatility and kind of can be those unique playmakers for them, but new coaching staff uh, over there for them. Bill Belichick's out, so I'm interested to see how the Patriots are going to look in 2024. But Jaheim Bell with a visit up there in New England. And then Trey Benson is right up there with Jared Verse with tied with the most NFL top 30 visits that have been reported and shared. The Dallas Cowboys, the Carolina Panthers, the Buffalo Bills, and the Browns. He, it, 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 I feel like just going off of these four teams right here, the excitement wise to me just market wise cowboys i know everybody's gonna hate that but man it, i would love to see him kind of take that big role there as a, as a as a lead running back for the dallas cowboys but also to the bills could you imagine that with josh allen that would be super super fun uh, after they just lost digs to at the wide receiver room that's one that wouldn't make too much sense for me because james cook had a great season especially the latter half of the season it's why they're able to move on from stefan Diggs because they kind of transition to that more run focus offense yeah. um, and it worked. I mean, they won what six of the last seven. James Cook was really good. Do they really want to start splitting him some carries with Trey Benson? And yeah, certainly Dude, possible. I, I just feel like that staff is so still twisted on Cook. I mean, if, if you, you remember when they benched him for, I don't know which game Wasn't it was. Two years ago, though? In the season. And that was this last year. Um, they benched him. And then, too, if you think about it, the biggest thing on him, on Cook, is hand, taking care of the ball. You look at Craig Benson. He's the best running back in the class and and has been by a mile of taking care of the ball and not fumbling. So that'd be a whole 180 from James Cook. But they're doing their due diligence and bringing him in for a top 30 visit means that they have some high interest in him. Honestly, the team that makes the most sense to me is a team that's – they've got some heavy interest in him as a reporter yesterday, but the New York Giants – I think would make a ton of sense. Obviously, Saquon Barkley left mm -hmm. to go to Philly. I think they brought in David Montgomery, but uh, I think Trey Benson's got a higher ceiling. They've got a yeah. pick at the top of the third round. I think that would make a ton of sense. Also, like the Cleveland, you know, Cleveland yeah. Browns, he can go play with Jameis and, you know, obviously Nick Chubb. We're not sure when exactly he'll be available. Probably going to be rehabbing into the season a little bit. That would be a good fit. You know, they've been able to produce solid running backs over the years. Yeah. I think Cleveland or Dallas are probably the two that I'm looking at for him the most. Mm -hmm. It just seems like a Jerry Jones kind of pick for for Benson to well, go. They, need, they certainly need it. They desperately yeah. need it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, keep an eye. That's just why this NFL draft is going to be so much fun. Uh, then over here, staying <laughs> offensively, just a few more guys. Jay Trav, uh, the New York Jets, 
and the Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders there. Um, something that has stirred up a big time conversation when we put out an article about, about him visiting with the Raiders, you know, they're, they're kind of 50, 50, if they want that, you know, if they want J Trav there and, and all that kind of stuff, here's the deal. You know, the whole thing with J Trav, people got to do their homework a little bit on this for Jordan Travis's guy coming back. And I think too, he's working out. He should be working out soon too for uh, some teams are hopefully going to be putting up some tape here soon. Uh, he said that he wanted to do some workouts on the field and show that, you know, where he's at and his rehab process. But uh, the New York Jets is pretty interesting there. Imagine him sitting behind Aaron Rodgers for and- how long that's going to last. And Tyrod Taylor, who they signed this offseason, who I think Should J. Trav kind of – yeah, he compares really well with him. Smaller guy, not as big of an arm, but can run. Uh, and as a smart football player, I think that would be a great situation for him. And that, In fact, that's who I have him mocked to in the previews I'm going to be doing for no game day here in the next week or so. That's where I have him ending up. So I think he'd be a phenomenal pick. That would be great, you know, because obviously he probably needs another season to kind of rehab and get himself back to full strength. I think being able to learn – find Aaron Rodgers and Tyrod yeah. Taylor. I mean, that's that's as good as it gets, um, honestly. Uh, there was another one by – I can't remember the writer's name, but for ESPN, the recent mock draft had him going in the sixth round to the Atlanta Falcons. And I think that's another one that's interesting to me, you know, sitting behind Kirk a little bit. The Falcons don't really have a young quarterback on their roster, a prospect anymore. And J. Trav could uh, fit into that role nicely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, one more that we need to mention is Johnny Wilson with the Eagles here as well, which is an intriguing one, which makes some sense there too with what they have <clears throat> in their arsenal too. There's a question, you know, I need to bring up too, and I'm I'm doing my search. Maybe we can reach out and figure out some things here. But Renato Green could have some top thirty visits. I just don't think those have been shared. Publicly. Yeah, I've I've looked. I pretty much search every day for top 30 visits. Renardo hasn't been talked about for a top 30 visit. He's talked about that. He met with the Packers, Vikings, Cardinals, Colts, Seahawks, and saints, especially like specifically at the combine and the East West shrine bowl. But as of now, no public top 30 visits. And for the most part, it's pretty easy to find info on these. I'm a little surprised he hasn't picked up any visits. And one team that I think he'd be perfect for, as much as I'd hate to see it, is Detroit. He just feels like a Dan Campbell Detroit Lion kind of player because he's tough-nosed, physical. He's not afraid to tackle, which they want at their corner position. I think that'd be a great fit, but they haven't been mentioned so far. Hey, match that with Braden Fisk. That That's mm. that's what I would like to see with Dan Campbell. 100, 150%. Oh, yeah. Um, But... Uh, this is from Reen on YouTube. Uh, do you think Brown, Jalen Brown, the LSU transfer, will step up in that wide receiver room? We've talked highly of him, honestly, throughout the last couple of episodes. Honestly, throughout the whole spring. But uh, there's a there's a there's a good chance a speed thing is probably what is the most intriguing to this offense for Mike Norvell and what they're going to try to do this upcoming year and this kind of new scheme with uh, DJU at quarterback, but uh, I can see, I can definitely see him uh, take a, take a step and see if how much playing time he can get. It's just such a loaded room, which is a good thing, but uh, there's been some really encouraging signs from what we've heard from Dustin at, at camp and some things and scrimmages. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing coming into the spring for him, I thought was his size, you know, cause we saw after tour of duty that he had lost a little bit of weight, I think down to, what was it, Logan? Do you remember 172 pounds yeah. or yeah. something like that? So it was like, how's he going to look? And I think he's still been moving pretty well, you know, especially during this middle part of the spring. At least one time at practice, you're seeing Jalen Brown get out and catch one of these deep shots, whether it's in one-on-one, seven-on-seven, team drills. He's he's a playmaker for sure. But like you said, Logan, there's a lot of depth, a lot of competition in this wide receiver room. It's going to go, I mean, it's been going through these first nine practices, but it's going to go all the way to fall. And I mean, into the season at the, as these guys compete for reps, it's a very talented unit. A lot of guys are really neck and neck and, you know, we'll see who's able to win out on these jobs and the majority of reps by the time the season arrives um, in August. But I think right now, Jalen Brown definitely in consideration to play a really big role on Florida State's offense. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode. Hoping to have on a guest next week as we jump in and, and kind of preview the spring showcase. It's not a spring game. I know a lot of FSU fans have kind of learned that now from Mike Norvell and how he runs the thing. So uh, there will be a little bit of some competition, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll jump into a preview of that. We'll continue to talk NFL draft as that's just all in almost two weeks away. Super stoked for that. So we'll keep you guys fully updated on that front, but hoping to have a uh, big playmaking guest for you guys. Fingers crossed everything goes well, but uh, that's going to do it for this week's episode. As always, you can listen to podcasts on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. If you're on YouTube right now, hit that like button. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Hit the bell too, so then you get notified every time we release a new episode. Really do appreciate everybody hanging out with us this evening. And uh, we'll see you next week. Peace.